So as we talked about in the previous videos, uh, we figured out why it is that we're studying whatever it is that we're studying. We've um, figured out that it's better to sit down and study longer periods than it is to do short chunks, right? We found our happy space, which is right here, right now, sitting down, right? And um, we've got a to-do list and our schedule, which is going to allow us to sit down for a while and study something new. And our on our to-do list is to learn a little bit of linear algebra, read a little bit of physics, and learn a little bit of uh, contemporary present day politics. Okay, so what we're going to do in this video right now is take a look at how to read a textbook. Okay. Now, one thing I should mention is, um, or someplace that I'm gonna direct you right now, if you're interested in figuring out how textbooks are introduced into the school curriculums is an article or a chapter from a book by Richard Feynman and he's the guy who, who the book that we're going to take a look at he's a he was a probably one of the best known physicists in the United States um, in the world really and um, in 1960s in 1964 i believe he he was asked to join the california state curriculum board or something like this where they reviewed textbooks to be introduced to the school system and he participated in that project and he got you know textbooks sent to him and um, he reviewed textbooks and you know that were going to be introduced in the uh, school curriculum in California, in the United States. And from that experience, he, you know, wrote a chapter, an introductory chapter in a book that he put out in 1985, I believe, explaining why most textbooks in most schools are so bad. Okay, so if you want to know, you know, why some of the textbooks or a lot of the textbooks that you get introduced to that you're forced to use in high school uh, why they're not uh, some of the best books uh, around that article will explain to you why that is okay and of course uh, if you're interested in a extremely in-depth analysis of our education system uh, John Taylor Gatto is uh, who you want to look at um, and he's talked a lot about textbooks and the school curriculum and how things are structured and, and the problems with them, right? And there is also an amazing book put out by Krishnamurti and um, it's called Education and the Significance of Life and that's an amazing book to read. And again, critiquing um, our education system and some of the problems associated with our education system, right? So uh, we're not going to talk about what the problems are with the education system because if you're in school, you're dealing with some of those issues right now. What we're going to talk about is how to bypass those problems. Okay, so what we're going to do is take a look at these books and figure out what the best way is to read textbooks. Okay, now before we take a look at these books, what you have to keep in mind is uh, two things about textbooks, okay? The two of the most important parts of a textbook. And those happen to be the table of contents and the index, okay? Now, when you pick up a textbook, if you find out that it doesn't have either an extensive table of contents or an extensive index, then you should put that textbook down and try to find a better textbook okay more emphasis on the index than the table of contents okay because the table of contents could be actually simple could could be a very you know it could be a one pager which is the case for days of destruction okay or it could be a multi-page table of contents and the way you should take a look at this is the table of contents for a book is the way the thought, the, the information has been organized and the way it's going to be delivered to you, okay? 
So it's really important. It's just basically, you know, if you've ever taken notes from a textbook, and if you're in school, hopefully you have, right? If you've ever taken notes from textbooks, what you're really trying to do whenever you're taking notes is take a chapter and condense it into a shorter chunk, a smaller chunk, right? That's what taking notes is. What you're doing is reducing the amount of content, taking out the, you know, just, uh, just filtering out the noise and taking it down to the chunks, to the chunks of information, to the bits of information. And the table of contents for books is basically chapters taken down to their key words, to their key, key thoughts, right? And if a textbook is organized well, then from beginning of the textbook, from the beginning of the table of contents to the end of the table of contents, the train of thought, you should be able to read the table of contents and follow that train of thought, okay? And that is what basically the book is all about. The index of a book allows you to find specific topics right away. And it's extremely useful if you're using a book, if you're using a textbook to study, okay? So keep that in mind. The most important parts of a book are the table of contents and the index. And the third most important part of some books is the bibliography, the footnotes, where they're referencing other material, okay? And that really, that comes into play for math textbooks somewhat, but it comes into play a lot in politics, economics, and non-science-based tech textbooks a lot because they are taking ideas from different places and presenting them, or they're taking data and analyzing that data, okay? So as far as these books are concerned, the first book we're gonna take a look at and flip through is a book on linear algebra, okay? And um, this book is very specific when it comes to mathematics. It's basically focused on one specific aspect of math math mathematics, which is linear algebra. The next book we're gonna look at is, um, I guess this is considered um, one of the masterpieces for physics anyway. It's uh, uh, the main author on it is uh, Richard uh, Feynman. And again, he's, um, one of the best known physicists uh, of the 20th century uh, in the United States and in the world really and he worked on the Manhattan Project I believe and he was an amazing lecturer and he wrote a lot of books and he did a lot of critique of society and this is a book he put together with two other authors uh, um, on physics okay and it's quite extensive and it's very good and it's volume two and I believe this is the second printing okay and the third book we're gonna take a look at is a politics book, politics and economics. They're sort of meshed together, politics and economics. And um, it's a book by Chris Hedges and Joe Sacco. And Chris Hedges is basically um, a journalist, um, one of the best known journalists, independent journalists in the world right now. And uh, this book is amazing if you wanna understand what's happening in the United States at the present and what, ha what has been going on, what we've been building up to for the last couple of decades. And Joe Sacco is um, uh, a cartoonist, a comic book, uh, an artist that sort of gave birth to comic book journalism. And his work is absolutely amazing. And he's, and he's published a few books um, on a few different uh, topics, war zones, occupations. and his work is extremely heavy and it's brilliant and he basically you know gave birth to comic book journalism and he's absolutely magnificent and this book is um, as far as i'm concerned should be a must reading for any uh, poli politics economics uh, curriculum uh, in high school and in university and in the future this book will be taught in history classes there's no doubt about it because it provides a lot of information, a lot of data, compiles a lot of info on what's going on in our society right now, okay? So that's sort of the introduction of, uh, you know, what we're going to do. Now, keeping in mind that the table of contents and the index are the most important parts of the book, okay? What's inside is really dependent on what you find in, 
uh, uh, important is what you're looking for really because very few science-based books uh, science-based te textbooks uh, you'll end up reading from beginning to end okay because there are especially in higher level mathematics higher level science education is because you really focus on specific topics okay and if you're lucky enough to find a textbook that is well written uh, you end up keeping it okay so keep this in mind if you're in the mindset of learning of studying and picking up tools that will help you out in life you're gonna have a library and keep that library stocked with books that you find important that you find useful and just like any other field any other genre um, the number of brilliant tech book textbooks out there um, is much much fewer than the number of bad textbooks okay now as for these books we're going to take a look at and uh, we're just going to sort of skim through them just to show you how what the best way it is to read certain textbooks the first book is a linear algebra book okay it's the second edition uh, linear algebra and its applications uh, Gilbert Strand Strang uh, Strang okay I'm really bad at pronouncing names so uh, my apologies to the authors and uh, and whatnot right and uh, this book is the second edition what year was this published then? Uh, Massachusetts Institute um, the author Gilbert Strang was uh, from MIT Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology okay and uh, this book is uh, as far as linear algebra is concerned is, is a fantastic book okay and the copyright on this thing is uh, the first printing was 1976 and the second printing is uh, 1980 okay and uh, it was published in uh, I believe New York Fifth Avenue Academic Press and whatnot I, I usually end up whenever I pick up a book I usually end up reading this and if there's an introduction I usually end up reading the introduction as well because that's sort of the mindset of what the authors had in mind right so what we're gonna do is take a look at the table of contents right now and you can see um, there's a preface and the introduction is usually the preface so I do usually end up reading the preface to this okay sort of allows you gives you an idea of what the authors were trying to do right so it's usually a good read and gets you in the mindset of this book so it becomes more personal and as you can tell by the table of contents here there's chapter one and each chapter is, is broken down into subcategories right and usually when it comes to math textbooks they start off with the most basic concepts for each chapter right and they go to more complicated concepts and each chapter usually builds on the next if it's really specific on a certain topic right so for math textbooks it usually it's usually very difficult to pick up the book if you don't know this material to go to a chapter in the middle and learn that because you need to know the processes before that okay so if you're reading a textbook really pay attention math textbook anyway really pay attention to the chapters and what they're introducing you right so when you pick up the math textbooks have a read through the main chapter headings okay and get a feel for the flow of information because that's what the textbook is right determinants and then it goes on it builds from there right and then programming games like you if you don't know what determinants and matrices are there's absolutely no way you could get into understand most of what's being presented in computations with matrices and this stuff right so table of contents super important and then you have the appendix where they provide additional information okay and a lot of textbooks math textbooks and science textbooks have these the appendix in the back where they provide either tables with data where they provide graphs where they provide additional information 
right formulas. So take a look at what's available to you in the in the appendices, right? The references is the books that they're referencing. You got exercises and solutions, and you got the index. The references for math textbooks. If you're really digging down into a specific topic, they're important because you can go down further, right? Read more about that stuff. The solutions and exercises very important for any math textbook if you pick up a math textbook and it doesn't provide you with solutions okay put that book down go pick up another book that does provide you with solutions and exercises okay because for no matter what math course you're taking you're gonna have to practice right because what you see at the end of every chapter for any math textbook for in good math textbook I should say you're gonna have exercises exercises right every chapter is gonna have exercises that you're gonna to have to do because these are sort of processes that you're gonna to have to learn how to do okay and that's the table of contents as for the index so we go to the back and a lot of uh, unfortunately this book doesn't have it and a lot of good math textbooks what they do have is on the inside cover in the front and the back they sometimes have formulas and tables laid out and those are extremely useful okay and i really like math textbooks that do that because they took care on providing that information at a fingers a fingers tip right and what you'll find is a lot of textbooks have blank pages some textbooks anyway at the end and this is part of the printing process but these blank pages can be useful uh, and some some books I believe they provide these blank pages for notes as well where you can take notes yourself okay now here is the index for this book okay and just to let you know I've picked up books math textbooks and other science textbooks where the index is just one page you know the book could be extremely thick and the index is one page and I never buy those books and I never use those books because no matter how good the inside material is right if you can't find exactly what you're looking for quickly then it becomes extremely difficult to use okay so the index here you know is alphabetized right and this is not a bad index and some of the best indexes you'll see they there's main categories and then there's subcategories so for example for this one you see inverse and then inverse has you know they've broken down to four different places where they talk about it and they you know because it's used in different types of processes when for mathematics anyway different types of things that you're going to do okay so this index is pretty good not bad multiple pages take a look at the subcategory for matrices this is one of the main topics for linear algebra right where you look at the matrices right and it's broken down extensively into multiple multiple subcategories because that's what it is it's used everywhere right so this is a good index right and then you have your let's go to solutions and exercises and this is a good uh, okay so let's take a look at the references so for references for math and science based well for science more so but for math the references aren't that many usually okay so if you want more readings on some of the topics that these guys are talking about in this book you know there's one page of references you'll find out for days of destruction days of revolt the references the bibliography is huge because there's a lot of data especially Chris Hedges Chris Hedges is he's a, he's a journalist and one thing he does is he digs down into the data and he presents the data and he provides a lot of references for that okay so this is the references you got solutions and exercises but solutions to exercises right and the exercises are at the back of every chapter usually every chapter has exercises right and this book is really good because it provides solutions for every question okay 
you'll find that some math textbooks only provide solutions for every second question. And I really don't like that. I, I know why they do it because that way teachers can only, you know, can assign uh, questions for uh, the ones that solutions are not provided, right? This one seems to be missing a couple of them, you know, 3.8 is not there right i'm not sure why i haven't looked at this looked at this specific one right so there are some gaps that could be because it's more uh, a general question that they're providing so there could be multiple multiple answers it could be an opinion piece right so this is a very good uh solution for the stuff and it's clear and if you're lucky enough some books actually provide uh, the solutions in a sense where they they show you how they obtain the solutions right how they solve the problems and that's very good as well okay and the solutions chat section is should be huge for any math textbook okay. and this keeps on going keeps on going and we should get into the appendix yeah and the appendix is you know referencing stuff further info on a specific topic so the appendices are important as well if you want to follow up right it's an idea that they're presenting okay as for reading the textbook so the preface again if you're into having a grasp of what it is that the author is trying to or the authors are trying to present it's important to read okay and it's useful and usually the the preface is not very uh, very long there are prefaces that are read that are as big as chapters okay now you get into chapter one this is how you're going to read math textbooks and math textbooks you read differently than you do physics textbook to a certain degree and non-science based textbooks when it comes to math textbooks always read the header Keep in mind the header, what chapter you're in. Keep in mind the subheaders, introduction. This is just give you a general overview, right? Of what's going on, what you're going to talk about specifically in this book, in this chapter. Always look at the examples that they're presenting. Extremely, extremely important. Uh, so if this is an, an example of Gaussian illumination, if this isn't a full example, you read this example all the way to the end. Because when it comes to math, one reason you're looking at the examples is because when you're solving a specific type of problem, it has a certain pattern that flows. There's, you know, when you start solving certain types of problems, there, there's visuals that come at you, okay? There's a geometry, symmetry within the specific type of problems you're solving for, right? So if you're able to notice a certain problem, and you know what the pattern how you're going to go how you're going to solve it what the pattern looks like then the odds are you know how to do that problem okay and we'll take a look at that in the next video but basically take a look at the examples read the bold stuff 100 percent. you read the bold stuff and if you need to understand what's going on with the bold you read the sentence before and the sentence after and if you still don't understand it read the paragraph where the bold appears okay there is a reason that they're making text bold because it's important they want it to stand out there's a reason where they make text italic right so read italics as well for this book the bold and the italics are sort of to a degree it's hard to pick out the italics okay for other books other math textbooks it's easier okay. so for example what does this say if n um, is at all large, a good estimate for the number of opera operations is this. This is an important thing to keep in mind, right? Okay. If you're dealing with matrices and uh, determinants of matrices, right? So we keep on going and these are, you know, examples, examples, and that's the way it works with mathematics sometimes when you start well not sometimes but usually when you start understanding how a problem works how an example is laid out right when you see this the example is larger for 1.2 then 
you know, for the for the later stuff because they shrink it down. They reduce the number of operations they show you, right? They reference back to the main one. So you should keep that in mind. And what happens is the reason they do that for math textbooks specifically is because you should know the pattern. You should know how the solutions are obtained, right? Once you learn a process, then you don't have to go through all the little intricate details of that process over and over again. You just know how to do it and you solve it, right? So later on in the chapter, you shouldn't have to, you know, go through every question, every problem, every solution provided. You'll just know how to do it. Okay. And that's how you look at the look at the look at the examples when it comes to science textbooks extremely actually economics and politics as well extremely important to take a look at the graphs and the visuals that is provided or that are provided okay and read the description of the diagrams okay so diagrams graphs charts extremely important for all textbooks read them spend time on them make sure you understand what this visual means because this visual is an explanation of what you just did right so visuals are extremely important in all textbooks and you should always always whenever you get to the visual pause right take a look at this thing try to figure out what this thing is saying and how it relates to the pro uh, to the problem that you, you just did or you just looked at right and once you start reading a certain math textbook you get the feel of how the authors are presenting the information so you won't have to read all these numbers right you'll just get uh, sort of chunks of information coming at you right you'll know what this stuff means right because that this is basically the same as this right all that's happened is the numbers have changed so the process stays the same right so once you start reading a math textbook you find that you start going through it faster and faster okay. for math textbooks extremely important to look at the formulas especially formulas I'm not sure if this book does it especially formulas that number their formulas okay Hopefully this one does it as well, but it doesn't appear so. But there's a lot of textbooks that, you know, just like, you know, numbering their figures. So this is figure 1.3. They number their formulas and they've done it here, I guess. This is explanation, right? 1A. And this is something that you're going to have to know, right? So anything that's highlighted and numbered keep those in mind know where they are know how to access them and understand what this means it looks complicated right with the sub numbers right subtext but it's not complicated if you fully understand the process of what's going on it's just terminology okay so let's just keep on flipping through this and what you find out is when they're presenting more and more ideas, you end up having more and more highlight stuff, right? And here's the formulas. This is number eight, right? This is what you want to keep in mind. Okay. Important. 1D, 1C, 1B, 1E. Well, you know when they number these guys, they're going to refer to them further on in the book. Okay. So get to understand this because to understand the stuff, further down the book you have to know what these guys are okay because they're basically telling you this is important to them this is this is what's important from this chapter as long as you understand what the process is right here's another example right if you already understand what's going on here you end up just skimming through this okay and they have different subtexts here right so keep all of these in mind and again subtitles not subtext subtitles right bold now they're talking about a new concept they're introducing a new one so you should spend some time understanding this more highlighted stuff more determinants more matrices right
important formulas. Learn these. Learn these if you're t if you're learning linear algebra. Okay, so let's flip through this a little bit and see if we come to. So that's the end of chapter one, right? And they provide you with exercises, review exercises here, and they have the solutions in the back, right? So if we flip this, this is chapter one, right? Review exercises, and the solutions would be right here for chapter one solutions to exercises and that way you can do a problem and look up the answer and one thing you should keep in mind if you're learning a new process for mathematics never ever sit down and do everything in the in a certain section and then check all the answers right don't sit there and do 10 problems in a row and then check all the problems uh, all in one shot not at the beginning anyway if you're trying to learn something new do one question look up the answer if you got it wrong try to figure out why you got it wrong if you can't go to the next one do the question look up the answer right because if you end up doing a whole bunch of questions in one shot and looking up all the answers in one shot if you were doing it wrong from the beginning then you just reinforced the wrong method for yourself 10 times right so it's going to take a little bit of doing to undo that what you want to do when you're learning a new process is read do a question look up the answer make sure you got it right before you move on okay and that's you know the main gist of how you read textbooks look at the visuals look at what they're doing read the highlighted stuff right math textbooks you can go through fairly fast once you learn a certain process before you learn that process you have to spend a lot of time with math textbooks and reading these things and don't you know don't let stuff like this scare you where they give you you know exercise this if this is this this is this and they give you a whole bunch of letters and um, you know the number or whatnot this is just groups of information just an idea coming at you right it's these are really sentences in mathematics right so if you know the terminology then this isn't anything new you understand what this is so what what is referring to right you're sort of building up your vocabulary when you're doing these things and this math textbook is it's a pretty good textbook so i flipped through this when i was spending some time as a note here uh spending some time uh with linear algebra but my main linear algebra core uh, book was another book that i have in storage and that's the one i used uh, to learn my linear algebra and again it just builds from here and continues and and this book is sort of uh you know the same format follows it's got highlighted areas it's got numbered uh the, um, what do you call it just principal formulas that you have to learn right um basically condensing what they were talking about here right spend your time with the visuals understand what that is because that basically is this right but once you read this and look at the visual if you understand the visual then you understand this right and then you can move on to the exercises and do them right so for example this is exercise 6.2.10 right so if we go to chapter six oh sorry this is yeah this is chapter six so we're going to go to chapter six in the solutions so we've got 6.2 6.2.10 right this is the question here is the solution right 6.2.10 so once you read this right what's this uh, section all about let's go back let's go back there we go 
test for positive uh, definiteness. Okay. I think I used to know what this stuff was. I haven't done linear algebra for a long time, right? So 6.2, that's what the section is all about, right? You read this, read this, read this, read this. Look at the visual. They're explaining to you what the visual is, right? And again, this is 6.2.1, right? This is the most basic concept. 6.2.10 is a more complicated concept, right? It's the third most complicated, usually in general, concept. But you have to know what the previous stuff was, right? So you have to go through this. So math textbooks in general take a little bit longer to go through sometimes if you understand the concepts then they're very quick reads okay because you end up using these things as references because once you learn a certain process you don't have to keep on relearning that process right if you know how to do long division you know how to do long division you don't need to learn how to do long division again every time you do long division right it's it, it's different mathematics is powers that you're obtaining once you know how to do it you know how to do it the second book we have here is a physics textbook and this is i think considered to be one of the best textbooks out there when it comes to physics uh, mainly i believe I'm, I'm not too familiar with the other authors but mainly because of richard feynman okay and uh, this is a uh, volume two okay uh, lectures on physics and Richard Feynman Robert Layton and Matthew Sands uh, Stanford University professor of Stanford University uh, California Institute of Technology Caltech I believe and uh, again Richard Feynman um, the main the best known author in this okay and uh, the first printing of this was in 1964. Okay. First printing of this was 1964. And uh, this is the fourth printing, 1966. So it went to fourth printing pretty fast. Within two years, they printed four printings of this, right? And um, let's throw this back here. Richard Feynman preface. So Feynman presents us... Um, you know does a little introduction to this and again it's not very long but it explains why he put this book together and remember this is uh, he wrote this preface in 1963 right uh, this is copyright 1964 and in 1964 is when he served on the uh, California uh, um, board for uh, to picking out textbooks for uh, for schools uh, for high school specifically and uh, he had a lot to say about that in 1985 and I'll post a link to that article in, um, in the description of this video okay so that was the preface here's the forward I'm not sure who the forward is written by uh, Matthew Sands so the other author wrote the forward Matthew Sands um, right in 1964 when the book was going to print now lecture on physics physics is an extremely extremely large topic right uh, mathematics using the language of mathematics to understand the world around us right that's what physics is uh, the physical world okay and as you can tell is table of contents is going to be huge for this it's going to be large anyway much larger you know it's got two columns right because there's a lot to discuss in physics right so it's not focused like uh, the linear algebra book just on linear algebra matrices and stuff that deals with that where this book is very focused this is a broader book and talks about let's see what are some of these things electromagnetism differential calculus on vector fields vector integrals electrostatics application of gauss's law the electric fields electric field electrostatic energy electricity down. so all of this from chapter one to ten um, actually except the vector stuff 
So a lot of electricity, electromagnetism will be here. Uh, magnetics, magnetic fields, vector potentials, laws of induction, Maxwell's equations, huge, huge, right? Principle of the least action, um, circuits, gravity, this is a great book. Waves, guys, electrostatic dynamics, field energy, field momentum, Lorentz transformations, um, motions of charge, tensors, reflection, magnetic. So this uh, second uh, volume looks like it deals with a lot of uh, electricity and magnetism, e EM, electromagnetics and magnetic fields, and water, uh, not water flow. Um, water and electricity to a certain degree for physics, uh, you can look at them in a certain s same type of way. It's sort of weird concept. Uh, fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics is, uh, I found fluid dynamics to be very difficult uh, when I studied it. And four physics books, four textbooks like this, specifically science-based textbooks, you can, for the most part, you can dive into a certain chapter. You do need to know some of the basic stuff. For sure, you need to know some of the basic stuff. But once you learn some of the basic stuff, the concepts sort of can jump around, okay? So you can pick up a chapter if you, if you specifically want to, you know, get into Maxwell's equations, then you can go to Maxwell's equations and read this. And at the beginning of this, it will reference stuff from the previous chapters. So if you know some of the basic stuff, then you're all set to attack some of the some of the more complicated chapters okay so very extensive table of contents and it provides you the train of thought that they were going with how the information is being presented right so before you start going through the books you should definitely look at the table of contents and have a feel for how the information is being presented okay as for the index for this it's going to be quite extensive because they cover a lot of stuff and you can tell it's a nice index All right and this is exactly what you want because you can pick up oh maxwell's equations right what are we in right they start talking about maxwell's equations and this is all the places where we start talking about mass maxwell's equations and you can go take a look at those pages right fantastic stuff and i guess they broke this down uh, into chapters uh, or it could be this is the volume one i believe that's probably what it is yeah so if you can see there's n no roman numerals here right a uh, one and two the odds are the two refers to the second volume and the one refers to the first volume and so number one, uh, sorry, chapter, um, volume two, chapter one, page 11, I believe. Let's take a look at this. Let's see if they talk about Maxwell. Uh, chapter one, page 11. Chapter one, page 11. Where are we at? Oh, we've gone too far already. Chapter one, page 11. Yeah, oh, it's just something here. There you go, Maxwell's discovery. So as soon as they mention Maxwell, there's Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electrodynamics. And Maxwell's equations are huge. And uh, if you're interested in electromagnetic and magnetic methods, uh, Tesla is where you wanna be at, right? He takes these things apart. Uh, Maxwell's equations there's uh, I forget how many there's four of them I believe but there's actually 20 that uh, again I'm going by memory I haven't taught touched uh, uh, magnetic electromagnetic methods for a long time okay so let's go back to the index and let's take a look at this all right so here's the index and again nice extensive index it's got subcategories right the main thing here is waves waves ultramagnetic waves light waves plane reflective waves shear waves sinusoidal waves spherical waves 
three-dimensional waves and transmitted waves, right? So if these are the subcategories, you read that and say wave, right? Electromagnetic, wave. Light, waves, right? So that's how you look at the index. And let's see, take a look at the table of, uh, this should be, uh, uh, oh, and they don't. It just goes into index. So there is, uh, I'm assuming there's some kind of bibliography in the back, but at the back of each chapter. Now, how to read a physics textbook. Beautifully done here. They break down what this chapter is about, right? So this looks like it's the same layout as this. 1.1 to 1.6, 1.1 to 1.6. Now, what you want to do, let's take her little index card, put it on the side. With this stuff, with physics textbooks, uh, chemistry textbooks, biology textbooks, any science-based textbooks, the columns on the side, anything appearing on those, you take a look at, you read it, and you get a feel for it, okay? Because that stuff is extremely important. As with the math textbooks, you read, you try to understand what the formulas are. And for physics textbooks, 100% the formulas will always be numbered, the important formulas, right? Sometimes they go through, in physics, they go through pages where, you know, they're trying to, they take multiple formulas, combine them, and they come up with a new formula. And that's the formula they're going to reference, right? So you don't necessarily need to know all the between steps. You just need to know what that formula means, right? The headers, right? The subheaders for the specific chapter. And always read the title of the chapter, right? This is electromagnetism, right? Electromagnetism, electrical forces, electric and magnetic fields. So subcategories, right? beautifully done always read the text that goes with the imagery right with the diagrams because that gives you a feel of what this paragraph is talking about so if you're reading a textbook like this one thing you know I took reading how to uh, speed reading courses at university I took a couple of couple of classes and it was okay if you're reading uh, uh, stories right speed reading when it comes to science textbooks you can't speed read you have to spend time with the ideas right so i really didn't find speed reading uh, you know i found some useful information they gave me right but i needed to retain the information so in general i'm a very very slow reader okay i savor the words i savor paragraph and sentences and chapters I take pause and think about things, right? And that's the way you sort of have to read physics, science-based textbooks and math textbooks, okay? So for these types of books, whenever you get into a new chapter, a new subsection, always read the first paragraph. Read the first sentence of every paragraph and Take a look at the drawings and the charts and the graphs on the side. Read the description. If you understand this and you understand the first sentence in the paragraph, jump to the next paragraph and read the next sentence. Okay. If you understand that, read the next par the first sentence in the next paragraph. If the paragraph happens to be long, read the last sentence as well. If it's very long, skim through it and read the middle sentences. So in general, what I retained from, you know, the, the reading courses that I took was read the first sentence of every paragraph. If the paragraph is small, that's all you need. If the paragraph is mid-size, you read the first sentence and the last sentence. If the paragraph happens to be large, read the first sentence, read a sentence in the middle or anything that is in bold for sure and read the last sentence okay that's one way you can cut back on your reading 
always read the information being presented on the sides always go through this go through this if you don't even look at what's here read through this read through this okay extremely extremely important take a look at the formulas being presented try to understand what they mean right there's a reason at the beginning here if you took a look the first thing they did in this chapter okay they laid down how the information is being presented again right then what does it say review chapter 12 volume 1 characteristics of force so they're telling you what you should have read from the previous volume this is volume 2 right and they're laying down how the information is being presented in this chapter right so they're giving you a prerequisite they're telling you how the information is being laid down and the next thing they did when it comes to physics there is a lot of you know letters a lot of shorthand in physics in all sciences really where they use a letter to represent a word or an idea so they're giving you all the letters all the symbols that you need to learn to know really because you can't really learn this in this chapter if they're giving it to you they're defining all the all the symbols they're going to use right so these are all greek alphabet how you're going to read them how you're going to say them right theta alpha beta gamma phi right and what they end up doing is using these words these letters in their formulas right so you're going to have to know what those letters mean and then define what those letters mean in the description okay so if you don't know what this letter is, E0, Epsilon, right? So you look at this thing, you go, you know, how do you pronounce that, right? You pronounce that as Epsilon, okay? So they tell you how to pronounce these letters. And usually when it comes to physics, at the end of the the formula they tell you what the letters are right where epsilon zero is a convenient constant right so when it comes to science based books the formulas that you're given after those formulas or before the formulas they explain to you what the letters represent okay so you really have to when you look at a formula you really have to go above and below it as well you have to read those because you have to know what the formula says and the way you should think about formulas presented in science is their sentences okay their relationships their functions so you have to understand what those are and when an idea is being built up all right they give you this they present visuals inside of the text and a hundred percent you have to follow this and usually when they're building up concepts like this you have to go back to the beginning of this and read all of this to be able to understand this concept because what they're telling you is they couldn't condense this information on the sides okay they're telling you that this is extremely important okay read these again subheads subheaders right and usually you end up reading the last section of a chapter because that sort of in general provides a summary of what you just talked about okay so you read the introduc introduction so you treat a chapter just the way you would treat a large paragraph right you read the first introductory part of it right you read the last chapter and you skim through the middle parts and read all the diagrams if you don't have the time to go through all of this right but if you really want to learn the subject you have to read this for the first time if you're learning it right 
And then we get to the second chapter, right? And again, they tell you review chapter 11, volume one vectors. So you have to know vectors before you can deal with differential calculus of vector fields, right? Oops, differential calculus of vector fields. If you don't know what vectors are, you can't learn this chapter, right? So when it comes to science and physics and mathematics and uh, and whatnot, ideas build on each other, right? So what you really need to do is learn something, the concept, the basic concept, and that's how you build on on that concept, right? And again, you take a look at this, look at the side information, look at the visuals. There's a tremendous amount of information being presented to you here. Okay. And over here, you can see they start off with 2.1, 2.2. They're numbering all of these. Okay. So the odds are they reference back to these. I'm not sure if this book, uh, yeah, for example, take a look at this. Over here, they've numbered this, right? They've numbered this and this but they haven't numbered this, right? So this one, they're not gonna reference to. So this one is not an important formula that you have to learn. This one is just for the flow of information, for you to comprehend what's happening, to understand what's happening, okay? And again, the diagrams. And this is a brilliant textbook. If you're, uh, if you're into physics, uh, volume one and volume two of this i don't know if i can i can't remember if there's a volume three i don't think there's a volume three or more more um and i really don't know where if i have volume one or not i probably have it somewhere in my boxes in my storage okay so that's how you read you know physics textbooks or chemistry or biology textbooks and definitely you read stuff that is bold coming at you in paragraphs and this one doesn't seem to have any uh, wow well, they have the letters in bold okay so definitely pick up on the letters and then you can just jump to specific chapters if you need to okay. this book uh, would be it would take you a long time to learn all the concepts in this book. Okay. Um, I don't think uh, there would be a one course that would cover all this. And beautiful drawings. Let me take a look at this stuff. This is before uh, we had access to uh, uh, graphics, easily graph, uh, easily providing graphics, um, right? Computer technology, right? Computer processing power was very slow in the 1960s. So take a look at this stuff. I'm not sure who drew these, uh, but this is just drawn by hand, the graphs, right? Look at this. Nowadays, uh, all of this would be done uh, uh, using technology, right? Using software. And there's definitely tables. You have to take a look at tables. You usually end up using these tables as reference. Matching up the, the rows, right? Lots and lots of information here. Okay, wow, what's this stuff? Wow, what is this? These are fields, I think, magnetic fields. What is this? Crystalline raft of bubbles. Oh, these are bubbles. Perfect, perfect crystalline raft of bubbles. Take a look at this. Bubbles. Chapter 30. There's a lot of information here. A lots, lots and lots of information. one of my favorite books in my uh, in my collection of math and physics science based textbooks okay wow they're driving something right only this one is numbered this guy is not this guy is not right this guy is not 
and obviously the graphs are super important to to read to understand okay. so that's how you read you know more physics based textbooks as for let's throw this guy back so we don't lose it right. as for non science based textbooks now if you take a look at this again this book is absolutely amazing um, it blew me away it's extremely depressing uh, because it's sort of a analysis of what's going on in our society right now okay but if you take a look at this days of destruction days of revolt uh, by Chris Hedges and Joe Sacco right and um, this was the first printing I picked it up um, all the all the visuals all the drawings are done by Joe Sacco and he's you know he gave birth to comic book journalism and Chris Hedges is probably the most trusted name one of the most trusted names in journalism and critique of our society and if you take a look at this uh, this was copyright 2012 okay the table of contents for this is very simple one page right days of theft days of siege days of devastation days of slavery days of revolt those are the ideas that's, that are being presented here and that's the flow of information if you've read this book if you read this book you'll understand why these subheadings are like this because it starts off from historical perspective showing you what the political and economic landscape was in the United States um, when the United States was being formed and what the end result was right they go to Pine Ridge South Dakota and the data being presented in this chapter just blew me away okay with um, mortality rates and poverty rates in the in the United States it was absolutely mind-boggling days of siege showing you that the same things happening in Camden New Jersey okay days of devastation is what the end result of days of siege was days of slavery is what the repercussions were right what happened to the civil the society right the populace in these areas and they talk about this here as well and days of revolt of what's coming it's a brilliant book if you're into politics and economics and I highly recommend this that's sort of an aside of how to read it but uh, how to read a textbook and when when I picked up this book I wasn't sure how I was going to receive it I read a lot of you know a lot of stuff from Chris Hedges before okay a lot of articles I've never sat down and read a book from Chris Hedges before and I read um, some of Joe Sacco's and I know Joe Sacco's stuff is extremely heavy you know I'm still going through Palestine I pick it up every few months and read a little bit more because I just can't read uh, what he did in one shot from beginning to end when it comes when it comes to Palestine he's done you know stuff on Sarajevo and, and a lot of other uh, war-torn countries and places right he's brilliant very heavy Chris Hedges brilliant very heavy put two brilliant people together very heavy book and it's uh, you can't drop you can't put it down once you start reading it so first thing I did was I read the introduction by Chris Hedges just to get a feel for what was you know what he was trying to achieve um, and he's he had some notes here highest and he's, he's giving some stats here right and when we looked at this you know the table of contents for this is very short right you got acknowledgement notes bibliography and the index here right so let's go to the bibliography and the index 287 and 293 287 287 oh he's got notes here 277 let's go to 277 first right So he's got notes here it's sort of a something that most books don't provide but he provided it because there's a lot of info being presented okay 
from each chapter and these are sort of the footnotes right so if you take a look at his footnotes for each chapter it's quite extensive and one reason he provides this because if you want to dig down to his data you can and i you know going through this and i i looked up some of this stuff and chris hatches is known to be um, basically the most honest journalist that as far as i know one of the most honest journalists that you'll ever encounter and he presents the data uh, and, and then builds an opinion on it right so he provides facts mathematics and his notes are you know ridiculously accurate and he you know provides these footnotes for people that you know want to dig down further and he's got his bibliography and is an extremely well-read person same with joe sacco an extensive bibliography right because he references a lot of stuff and then he's got the index and this is rare you know it's not as common for books like this on politics but he's got a really good index here as you can tell it's quite extensive because if you're trying to find you know his find data or you know sort of analysis of a certain topic uh you can go back here and look it up specifically and go to that chapter okay and this is extremely good uh as a reference book and i've used it a fair bit so for example if you want to know about enron and for those of you who know politics and economics uh, you'll know the name enron right and you can just go you know to page 89 and find out what it's all about okay so let's go you know flip through this book really quickly introduction i read notes data i read okay days of theft and you know when i first started reading this i wasn't sure how to take it right and this the imagery is by joe sacco is brilliant and you start reading it i start reading it start reading it and this stuff is it's you know it's not a science book so if you want to speed read through this you can you can just read the first sentence of you know shorter paragraphs for mid-sized paragraph you can read the first sentence and the last sentence for large paragraph read the first sentence pick a sentence in the middle read that and read the last sentence right for me i read every word sometimes i read certain paragraphs more than once right and the imagery by joe sacco brilliant and then what i started doing was starting taking notes in the book okay and that's one thing i do do if i come across extremely good books um, some books like this I don't muck up certain books I do muck up okay and I just started going ballistic with some of the stuff information that he was presenting taking notes highlighting underlining right beautiful imagery by Joe Sacco diagrams you know stuff like you know he's talking about Pine Ridge some stats regarding pine ridge and if you don't know what pine ridge is you should look it up if you live in the united states anyway and this book is brilliant in one sense because chris hedges is he's providing a lot of data a lot of numbers you can tell right and joe sacco goes into the personal the descriptive where they sit down and talk to people and hear their stories and joe sacco you know presented basically sort of a graphic novel comic book format of what was being said right and if you've been following my channel my uh what i do is um, i love comic books um, so uh this was a treat and a half for me reading information like this and reading you know comic book information presented in a comic book format from people that live in this area right drawn and uh, explained by joe sacco showing what's happening 
and it's actually brilliant and he uses you know quotation marks where it's the words of the people that they're interviewing okay and that's sort of the quick way of reading politics economics textbooks or or any textbook that's not science-based i guess where you know and i've done this with other courses that i've taken as well uh, this was personal uh, personal study session i guess information that i was learning but you know i end up taking a lot of notes in this book highlighting a lot of stuff for my own my own use okay and um, you know i just went when i hit uh, you know just stuff talking about education and stuff i would highlight and take my own notes healthcare stats and that's what chris hedges is very you know known for is providing a lot of statistics and again joe sacco providing you know information on uh, on um, on the people getting the first person perspective from the people and you know talking with them seeing what happened and that's how i you know read you know textbooks like this or books like this really i don't know if this is considered a textbook or not but for me it was because it was a book i was learning from and i use this book as a reference and i take notes in it and uh, this would be a keeper for me right and uh, you know again it's it's very important table of contents and the index are extremely important and just to give you an idea of how important the the table of contents is in a book when i was at university i you know sometimes you end up having multiple exams in just the two or three days and uh, one thing that happened when I was in university, in my third year university, I was taking an applied mathematics course, um, a second year applied mathematics course, uh, systems of differential equations, uh, and applying in the real world. And it was an extremely difficult course, extremely difficult. And I hadn't learned linear algebra before taking the course. It was a prerequisite, and I made the mistake of taking the applied mathematics course before taking linear algebra so when i was sitting in the course i realized i was pretty much uh, in trouble so when the final came along basically i hadn't really done well in the course up to the final so what i ended up doing is 10 days before the the final for my uh, differential equation course uh, came up I started studying for it and I had to learn linear algebra by myself so I picked up another book that I have uh, linear algebra and I spent about four days learning linear algebra and I was studying anywhere between 10 to 12 14 hours a day right and the next six days I spent studying the course material so I spent 10 days average anywhere between 10 to 14 hours a day studying for this course now my exam schedule was in a way where i had in the morning i had to write the exam for the math course and i had to write an exam for another course i was taking which was uh, economic geology and i had gone to every course in economic geology and if i can make a recommendation if you're taking a course at university or even high school uh, but university or college or after you know post secondary education go to every course even if you're not paying attention in large part or taking notes or even like the teacher when you go to this classroom and sit down you're getting exposed to the information right so after 10 days of studying extensively hard for a math course and writing a four and a half hour exam in the morning and no one in in the in the classroom had finished that exam it was extremely difficult everybody walked out with their brains being mush right in the afternoon i had my economics geology exam economics geology exam to write and i hadn't studied for it because the math exam was extremely important to me i had done poorly throughout the term and that you know with my assignments in the midterm i was failing 
brutally and what happens at university or college sometimes you're allowed to make the final exam worth 100 percent of your mark so that's what i chose to do opted in to do to make the final worth 100 percent of my mark so my whole course was dependent on the final exam and that took precedence right i had my to-do list and i set up my schedule and this was way more important than my economics geology exam because of my economics geology exam i had done well uh, so far and i was passing and the final exam was only worth you know 30 percent or 25 percent of the final right final mark so after coming out of the math exam i grabbed my sandwich ate my sandwich and consumed some sugar because i needed sugar to be able to function to kick the brain into gear again right and i opened up the book and i looked at the table of contents and in half an hour before the exam i memorized the table of contents right because the table of contents was a summary of what was being presented in the book okay so i spent half an hour memorizing the table of contents and as soon as i went into the exam i took the scrap piece of paper they had given me and i threw i didn't even look at the exam yet by memory i generated the table of contents okay now that i had the table of contents beside me because i had attended every lecture i knew the basic idea of all the information being presented for that course and that's when i took my exam wrote my name on it and opened up the exam and the exam was basically essay questions and long answer questions about the course about the book and what i ended up doing is i used the table of contents to answer all the questions and write the essays for that exam because essays are really just summarizing what was being presented in the book and the table of contents was a summary of what was in the book right and i ended up doing you know passing my math court exam when i finally ended up getting the results which was i was ecstatic about right because it was the most difficult math course i've ever taken in my life and i ended up acing basically acing getting 90 percent plus in my economics geology exam because i was able to present the ideas the way they were presented in the book because i had the table of contents beside me okay so extremely important i'll emphasize this again when you take a book when you're using a textbook as a textbook as a reference book as a book to learn something right the most important parts of that book are the table of contents and the index right given that the information between those you know the front cover and the back cover is well presented as well right it's a good book to read okay and that's you know how i end up reading textbooks how i end up using textbooks and best way to read textbooks as far as i'm concerned okay as for the next tip i have for you right tip number six i believe when it comes to studying what we're going to do we're going to take a look at how to you know and this is going to be a very specifically math oriented tip on how to study we're going to take a look at how you should lay down your questions how you should solve problems because what happens in mathematics certain types of problems play out in a certain way and math is very visual so if you end up reading a problem right and you're trying to solve an equation or graph a function there are certain things you have to do to an equation to be able to solve it to be able to graph it and a certain pattern emerges for specific types of problems so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at those patterns and what you should do whenever you're doing mathematics whenever you're solving certain types of problems you should remember the structure of that problem okay you should remember how that that question that problem plays out and is going to play out because if you know that then the odds are you know how to solve those problems you know how to answer the question you know how to graph those functions okay and that's what we're going to do with tip number six